In this video, we're going to talk about ionic and covalent bonding and define a few new terms with regards to ions or charged particles. So one thing you need to remember is that metals tend to lose electrons and nonmetals tend to gain electrons. And recall that an electron is negatively charged. So if a metal, a neutral metal atom was to lose an electron, that means it's losing a negative charge and it's going to have an overall positive charge. And if a nonmetal gains an electron, because electrons are negatively charged, that means they are going to have an overall charge that is negative. The charge on an ion is related to the number of valence electrons on the atom. So we'll talk about the reason for that in just a second. So we also talked about how group one metals, so those alkali metals, they have just a single valence electron, and they're gonna lose that one valence electron to become a positive one ion. So this is sodium. We've got this arrow, which kind of means yield. So sodium atom can lose a single electron, and it ends up having a one plus positive charge. And this is the ion, and this is the neutral atom. Metals lose their valence electrons to form ions. This is one characteristic of metals, is they lose electrons, they lose those valence electrons when they participate in chemical bonding, and they will lose, the, the number that they lose depends on how many valence they had to begin with. So predicting ionic charge, group one metals, those alkali metals, they always form plus one ions because they have one valence electron. Group two metals, those alkaline earths, they have two valence, so they form they lose those two valence and they form two plus ions. Um, group 13 metals, so that's jumping over the transition metals, that D block. Um, so we're talking about metals like aluminum and gallium and indium, that column. They form three plus ions because they're losing the two electrons that were in the S and then a single electron in the P. So they're losing three electrons. That's why they form positive three ions. And then group 14, the ones right next to it, so silicon, germanium, those form four plus because they're losing four valence. By losing their valence electrons, they achieve a noble gas configuration. So what that means what this noble gas configuration phrase means is they end up having a completely full outer shell. So if here's our nucleus, and here's the first level, the second level, the third level, if the um, if we're talking about our valence electrons, like say there's two valence electrons here on this outermost level, then that means there's two electrons here on the first and eight electrons here on the second. If we were to lose these, now we're just left with core electrons where the outermost level is now this one, and it's totally full. That's what we mean by noble gas configuration, because it essentially means it has the same number of electrons as a noble gas. The electrons are arranged now the same way as it would be for a noble gas. So we just talked about metals. Same kind of thing can happen for nonmetals, except they're going to gain electrons instead of lose. But they're, they end up having the same goal, so they're trying to achieve that complete outer shell, which they're calling a noble gas configuration because it ends up their outermost shell, their outermost level, ends up having the same number of electrons, the same arrangement, if you will, as a noble gas. So group 15, that's specifically like nitrogen and then phosphorus and then arsenic, they form minus three ions because they would want to gain three electrons to have basically a total number of eight. So notice here I said there were eight electrons total in that second one once it's full. Eight is kind of like the magic number. So group 15 nonmetals, so nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, they have five valence. Five plus three makes eight. So they want to gain three electrons and thus become a minus three ion. Group 16, so oxygen, sulfur, selenium, they have six valence electrons based on their position in the periodic table. Six plus two is eight, so they're going to gain two, 
which is why they form two minus ions. They gain two electrons, so now they have an excess charge, you know, in considering the entire atom of minus two because they have two extra electrons. So they're, as ions, they have a charge of minus two. 17 is the halogen, so you have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. They form minus one, again, because they have seven valence, and seven plus one is eight. So they're going to all want to gain just one electron, giving them a charge of minus one. So again, we can predict the charge that if an atom were to turn into a charged ion, we can predict its charge simply based on its position in the periodic table. Now here's kind of a summary of the ones that you want to really be familiar with. So in this final column on the far right, 18, these are the noble gases. And notice that we don't have charges. So one reason why the noble gases, we call them noble as in another, uh, another term is inert, inert, but they are non-reactive because they already have a complete outer shell. They're not going to want to gain or lose electrons. And it's those electrons being gained or lost, which essentially has, or was what's responsible for elements res participating in chemical bonding. Since this group is not really interested in gaining or losing electrons, they don't participate in chemical bonding. They are non-reactive. They are inert. Um, this is your halogen, so all of these, minus one, because if they gained one electron, then they would be just like the noble gases. Next group, the oxygen. Oxygen group, if they gained two, they would be just like the noble gases. If these gained three, they would be just like the noble gases. So again, that's that noble gas configuration that we talked about. Looking at the metals going the other direction, so group one, the alkali, they have one valence. If they got rid of that single valence electron, then they would be just like the noble gases. So sodium, if sodium lost its single valence electron, then it would be just like neon. So sodium has 11 electrons total, neon has only 10. Another example, barium right here. Barium is element 56. It has 56 electrons total, but it has two valence based on its position in the periodic table. If it ditched those two valence electrons, then it would be just like this one, which I've scribbled over it, but that's xenon, element 54. So 56 minus two is 54. Hydrogen is special, so we talked about how hydrogen is very special. It has a single valence electron, and most often it wants to lose that electron, um, but it is possible for it to gain in special circumstances like in organic chemistry discussions or inorganic chemistry discussions. So if you go on to university and major in chemistry, you'll take classes in organic chemistry and in organic chemistry where we might talk about hydrogen actually gaining an electron. If hydrogen gained one, then it would be just like helium. Again, achieving a noble gas configuration, having the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So we're introducing a new word now, isoelectronic. So isoelectronic means that it has the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So argon is an example of a noble gas. That's element number 18 on the far right. It has a complete outer shell. And all of these ions have the same number of electrons as argon. So phosphorus, for example, phosphorus is element number 15. If it were to gain three more, then it would also have 18 electrons, which is how many argon has. So isoelectronic means it has the same number of electrons and as a result, the same electron configuration. So how those electrons are actually placed in the levels and sublevels, those orbitals. So recall we said we defined core and valence. So core electrons are the ones found close to the nucleus. They do not participate in chemical bonding. Valence electrons are what we've been talking about. They're in the S and P, they're in the outermost energy level, those are the ones that do participate in chemical bonding, and those are the ones that we're always interested in. It is the valence electrons that are responsible for holding two 
or more atoms together in a chemical bond. And chemical bonding is what it's all about. That's why we're interested in valence. Now, this chart is actually from chapter 12. So we're starting to, starting to talk just a little bit about chapter 12. So this chart specifically is on page 350. But we've got two types of bonding that we're going to focus on. So ionic bonding is between a metal and a nonmetal. And they are not sharing the electrons. So they have become ions. Sodium example has lost and chlorine has gained one electron. They are just electrostatically attracted to each other. Positive and negative attracts, kind of like two magnets being attracted to each other. The other type of bonding is called covalent bonding. And here, this is between nonmetals, and they are actually sharing the electrons. So we, we can still think of them as being charged to, to an extent, but they're actually sharing the electrons. And that's kind of why we've drawn this water molecule where the spheres are overlapping each other a bit, because they really are sharing. Here, no sharing. They're just um, attracted to each other, kind of like magnets. And for proper language, when we say a molecule, Technically, we're talking about a covalently bonded molecule. Um, it's not strictly correct to, to say a sodium chloride molecule. That's not really the right way to say it because molecule implies covalent bonding. But sodium chloride, table salts, that is an ionic substance, and it's a different interaction. And this chart is also from page, or page, page 351, so this is 351. This is from chapter 12, but an ionic bond is formed by the attraction between a positively charged cation and anion. So we're introducing new words. We'll define them more properly on the next slide. But it, the point is between a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion. So just like in a magnet, two opposite ends of a magnet attract, positive and negative attracts. And it's an electrostatic, as an electro as in electrons and electricity electrostatic attraction between the two that brings them together. So this is an example of like a crystal lattice. So we've got the two colors. They're using purple for the sodium, the metal, and green for the chlorine, the nonmetal. So they'll come together in this regular arrangement, which we call a crystal lattice. So here they've got, oops, oopsies, sorry. <laughs> Crystal, crystal lattice, um, but it's a regular arrangement and it's a very, very strong interaction. If you have those strong um, rare earth magnets, sometimes those can be really, really hard to pull apart. Um, but it's formed from the combination of the ions. So anion and cation, we'll define in just a moment. It's a very, very strong attraction and it forms this rigid crystalline structure. And again, this is just ordinary table salt, but um, nice, uh, regular structure. So the words cation and anion, let's define those. So cat ion, not cation, but cat ion. Um, the cat part means positive, so positive ions are cat ions. Cat ions are formed when an atom loses electrons to become positively charged. And again, electrons are negative. If you lose negative, you're going to become positive. Most, most main group metals achieve a noble gas electron configuration by losing their valence and they become isoelectronic with a noble gas. So magnesium is their example in group two, an alkaline earth metal. It has two valence. It loses those two valence to become magnesium two plus. And then magnesium, so magnesium is element number 12. It starts off with 12. It loses two. Now it has only 10 total. And to kind of put it like a, in perspective, so 12 electrons also means 12 protons. So 12 protons in the nucleus and 10 electrons. Once it has become an ion, you can see you've got a net difference of two plus, and that's also another way to think of it. That's why it's a two plus ion. Those are cations, the positive ions, which metals, metals are always gonna form cations. And this is kind of just another summary, but the anions, as you might guess, might be negative. But let's look at this slide really quick. So we're going to do electron dot formulas and, and those structures next week. But we've got like sodium, for example, it has just a single electron and magnesium has two. 
Aluminum has three, so here's your aluminum, magnesium, and sodium. So they've got, sodium has just one, so it becomes a one plus. Magnesium becomes a two plus. Aluminum becomes a three plus. And each one, again, the point is so it can become just like neon. So it can become isoelectronic with neon, with the noble gas. Now anions, to define that term, anion is a negatively charged ion. So the an part is like negative and then ion. Anions are formed when you have a non-metal atom gaining an electron. So electrons are negative. If it starts off neutral and gains a negative charge, it's gonna overall become negatively charged. Most nonmetals will achieve that noble gas configuration by gaining the proper number of electrons needed to achieve that noble gas configuration so to have the same number of electrons. So an example from earlier was like oxygen has six valence electrons, six plus two is eight, so oxygen forms a two minus ion. Here's another example, so in group 17, you've got your halogens, chlorine has seven, seven plus one is eight, so it's gonna gain one electron to be isoelectronic with the noble gas that's in that same row, which is argon. So then here's our three examples again. So here's, they're using these little dots to represent the electrons. Chlorine has seven, seven plus one is eight. So now it has a total of eight and it's just like argon. Sulfur has six, six plus two is eight. So that why, that's why it forms a minus two. So it can be just like argon and phosphorus has five. If it gains three, then it'll be just like argon and it's a minus three. So they're all gonna end up being isoelectronic with argon when we're done. Now these here, we're gonna talk about this in the next video. These are electron configurations. So how we write those out, we will talk about this week, but in another video. So then next little thing on, on radius. So we talked about atomic radius, but one interesting thing, what happens when atoms gain or lose electrons is their size also changes. So notice with sodium, what happens? The radius got smaller. So if you think about what happens when a sodium atom loses, so it became positive implying it lost. When a sodium atom loses an electron, it's going to become positively charged. It's losing that electron in the outermost shell, so it gets smaller. Chlorine, to go from neutral to negative, it had to gain an electron. It actually becomes a little bit larger. So the radius of a cation is smaller than the radius of the neutral atom that started off with, and the radius of an anion is just a little bit larger than when it was neutral. So then covalent bonding, we had been just talking about ionic bonding, but covalent bonding is formed when two nonmetals share electrons, so it's specifically sharing, very important. And the shared electrons are technically bonding, they're, they kind of belong to both atoms, so they're sharing them. Not necessarily equally, but they are sharing them. So here's an example, hydrogen chloride, HCl, a hydrogen and a chlorine getting together. The hydrogen atom is sharing one of its valence with the chlorine. So that gives chlorine eight, which remember we said eight was the magic number. Chlorine has seven. If it gains just one more, then it would have eight. So this is kind of like how it's gaining that one. It's borrowing from the hydrogen. And so it feels like it's isoelectronic with argon and that kind of makes it happy or stable quote unquote happy, but, and then the same kind of thing happens in the other direction. So if hydrogen with its one electron had one more electron, then it would be kind of like helium. So the chlorine shares one of its valence electrons with hydrogen, giving it two. So that first level, level one, the one of sub level can only hold two, but it makes it isoelectronic with helium, which kind of makes it happy. So then just a quick summary of what we talked about in this video and the previous video, but elements in the periodic table are arranged by increasing atomic number, which also corresponds with how many electrons total. They have regular repeating chemical and physical properties, which we talked about. We've got our periodic trends like ionization energy and atomic radius and metallic character. The columns we call groups and the rows we call periods. So groups will have similar um, chemical properties 
and then there's other properties that change as we go across a period. Atomic radius and metallic character increase as you go from bottom to top and left to right. And then we can break the periodic table up into these groups. So this is the S block, the D block, the P block, and the F block. And then we have valence electrons. So valence are the ones involved in chemical bonding. Those are the outermost electrons, and honestly, the ones that we care about. And then you had core, which are the ones on the interior, which do not participate in chemical bonding. Ionization energy is referring to the amount of energy that's needed to remove an electron from that outermost shell or outermost level. So ionization energy is referring to removing valence electrons. And then this chart, um, very important that you understand how we got the charges here. So the plus ones for these and the plus twos for these, etc. And then all of the negative ones over here and then why these aren't charged. Make sure you understand the layout of this and why we're seeing what we're seeing in this um, setup of the periodic table.